It struck me the other day when I was recording a video lesson for this instrument, the DG Melodian, uh, that I keep saying the same things in every video lesson that I do. It would probably save an awful lot of time if I made a couple of uh, general videos uh, to cover some things that I keep saying. So this video is all about the actual playing of the instrument. If you watch this video and absorb the contents of it, it will stand you in good stead uh, for all the video lessons that you take from me. So this instrument is a DG Melodian. Uh, that means to say that this row here is in the key of G major and this row is in the key of D major. Um, and what I'm going to tell you in this video is stuff that's kind of specific to the way I teach, things you need to know if you like. Make sure you know what your layout is on your instrument. I mean, yes, this row is the G row, this row is the D row. But at this end particularly, there are lots of different ways that you can have the notes uh, set out. Uh, on this particular instrument, you know, this is called a fourth button start. And if you don't know what that means, well, this row is the G row. So if I press this fourth button and push the bellows towards the closed position, it gives me a note of G. See, G row, note of G. It's the root note uh, of that scale. Similarly, if I play the fourth button on the D row, fourth button down from the top, and push the bellows towards the closed position, that gives me the note D. So D note for the D row, G note for the G row. If you get the same thing by pressing the third button of those rows, then you've got what's known as a third button start. The reason uh, for having a fourth button start uh, is that you get more useful low notes at this end and less useless squeaky notes at this end. But a third button start melodian is absolutely fine. And at the time of doing this video, I'd say the majority of DG melodians are probably third button start although the tendency these days is for people like me to have them changed uh, by a professional fettler to fourth button start. Having said that, if you've got a fourth button start melodian, uh, there are lots of different uh, ways you can have these uh, lower pitched buttons tuned and make sure you know what yours is. On www.melodian.net, which is the forum for melodian players, there's a really brilliant page which has loads of different layouts and with a bit of experimentation I'm sure you can find out what yours is and make sure once you have found out what it is that you print out uh, the available chart for it then you'll always know what the notes are. It's probably a very good idea to learn the notes on your melodeon uh, especially uh, this kind of area here from the middle up to the top. It's good to know what the notes are will help you with the tunes that you learn. Although ultimately, of course, you should learn what all the buttons are, what notes you get from the push and the pull on all these buttons, and of course, on the bass side as well. Some DG melodians have an extra row of buttons on the inside here. Uh, those buttons will give you uh, extra accidental notes and other notes, uh, but generally you should be able to play everything that I teach you on a standard DG melodian, just like this. Having said that this melodian has got accidentals at this end, there are some DG uh, boxes which have low notes here. In, in other words, it's just an extension of the scale. So you'll just get more and more notes in the uh, major chord on the push and uh, other notes in the scale on the pull. Uh, but again, they tend to be uh, scarcer than the boxes that have accidentals at this end. As I say, make sure you know what your DG layout is. Another important thing is to learn the basses um, and this bass button here, very important, because if I press this button, it's button one on the inside row and push the bellows in, I've got a B minor chord. If you do that and you've got a B major chord, uh, then sometimes you have to make a few compromises. For instance, if I've got a B minor chord in my music, you won't be able to play it. So you can either play just a B note instead. Uh, if you press that button and push the bellows in, you get B. What a lot of people do if they haven't got a B minor chord on this button is they play B minor seventh instead. 
That's achieved by playing these two buttons and pushing the bellows in. This button here gives you a D major chord. This button gives you a B bass. And a B bass with a D major chord is a B minor seventh. You may be lucky enough to have a stop, like a big uh, button on the top of the melodeon. And if you pull it up or push it down, it may remove the thirds from the chords. And what that does, it turns your uh, B major, if you've got it, into a B5 chord, and that will do for minor and major. And I've had that done on my other melodeon, which is a Castanari Lily, because that had a B major, but I wanted minor and major, so that's a good compromise. So if you think about having some work done to your melodeon, have a think about that. And uh, you can have just that D sharp note, the third of the uh, chord taped over, a bit of electrical tape over that reed, and okay, you don't get the rich major or minor chord, but you do get a very useful five chord. Guitarists call it a power chord, which will work for B minor and B major. But make sure you know what you've got. Very many melodians from the factory come with B major on this button, uh, as opposed to B minor. And I've had this one tuned to B minor. It's very important to get comfortable when you're playing this instrument. Um, I've got arms on this chair, but luckily I can pull them up. So I'm going to do that straight away because they're going to get in the way of me playing. Um, yeah, it's all about the ergonomics of the study of people's efficiency in their working environment, he said, reading off the sheet. That's the uh, definition I got off Wiki. And uh, that's good, isn't it? I'll say that again. The study of people's efficiency in their working environment. You've got to get comfortable. If you're not comfortable, you're not going to enjoy playing. And if you don't enjoy playing, you're going to stop playing quite quickly. Uh, so, things to mention. The shoulder straps. I use two. This isn't a particularly conventional setup because this is a little uh, invention that my wife and I came up with. But basically the straps are connected uh, by means of buckles, which I can undo. And I've got a back strap as well. And that stops the straps falling off my shoulders the whole time. If you find that your straps are doing that, it's a very good idea to get a back strap and that stops that. Um, getting the height of the melodeon right is achieved by adjusting the straps carefully, the shoulder straps that is. Um, if it's really high, it's not very comfortable. If it's really low down, also not comfortable. Obviously, everyone is a different uh, size. I'm not a standard size, I'm very, very tall and I've got quite long arms. But for me, this is about right. Um, the idea is that the uh, fingerboard, the treble fingerboard should be in the middle of your body and the bass buttons sort of out to your left. Um, I've got mine sort of fairly straight, some people angle it. You know, you have to experiment to find out what is comfortable for you, but that is very important. The adjustment of the shoulder straps. Some people just use one strap, that's absolutely fine. And I've even seen people that can play with no straps and I, I admire them, but I wouldn't recommend it. The bass strap, this one here, uh, needs adjusting. This one's got a Velcro kind of um, adjustment on it. Um, basically, you need to get your hand in the right position to play. Your fingers need to be able to reach all these buttons. And it's got to move around, uh, but it's not going to be so loose that it's kind of flopping about in there. It needs to be sort of held in securely. Uh, it's a kind of a compromise between being too loose and too tight. And you can do that with a Velcro strap. Some melodians have a dial on the top called a rotella, and you can dial that in and out to adjust the, um, the tension of the bass strap. Because obviously uh, all the movement of the bellows is controlled by the left hand. Pushing in, you push against this side of the melodian, and pulling out, you push against the strap. So the adjustment of that strap is very, very important. Um, this melodian has two bellows straps, top and bottom. When you undo them, Make sure they're not fouling the uh, bellows. If you leave them there, they may foul the bellows. Um, I put mine in front, some people turn them right the way round. On some posh melodians, there's a parking stud uh, for the straps when you're playing. But generally, make sure they're not in the way of the bellows. Also, make sure you do the bellows up after playing because you don't want to leave your melodian with the um, bellows extended, it's not good for the life of the bellows. Another thing to watch is the bottom of the right shoulder strap. Very often it can appear 
on top of the uh, high pitch buttons and do that when you're playing. So make sure that it's tucked in behind. I remember a very embarrassing video I did years ago where I did the whole video with the strap over the top. Okay, it wasn't playing the button, but it didn't look very professional. So make sure it's tucked behind that lower part of the fingerboard where all those high squeaky notes are because you don't want those sounding in the middle of your lovely melodian tune. If you haven't got a melodian, make sure you choose one that you can manage. Um, this is a Hona Erica, it weighs about six pounds and it's an ideal weight for me. Some people are capable of holding something heavier, I'm not. Don't forget, if you're tempted by uh, a melodian with extra buttons and more voices, more reads, it all means more weight. Um, so, you know, be careful about what you buy because you might buy yourself a monster that you can't uh, hold properly and it's going to give you a load of uh, grief on, in your shoulder joints and your neck joints. Uh, this is a, a two read, two voice. If I play a note, I've got two reeds tuned a little bit apart. It gives me that kind of uh, beating, nice kind of warm sound. It's absolutely fine. You can get melodians where you can have a... a a lower voice as well, which you can switch in and out, but it's not vital, let's put it that way. And my little Castanari Lily has only got one reed, and that's why it's so light. And I use that an awful lot in lessons because I'm sitting here in front of the camera for sometimes up to an hour, and I use it when I'm working out tunes because I'm stuck in front of my computer for hours on end, and it's nice and lightweight. Only you know what you can manage, uh, but uh, this Melodian and my little Lily are absolutely fine for me. The way you sit is important. Um, out of shot here, I've got both my feet on the ground. It's not a great idea to have your, your legs sort of swinging around in the breeze. And also be very careful of your clothing. Make sure you haven't got um, you know, buttons and zips and belts that are gonna scratch the back of your uh, melodian case or the um, uh, bellows, you know, watch out for that. Early on in my playing, I used to get quite tense because you used to get lots of aches and pains. And somebody once said to me, you're holding your shoulders up like that. So you know, every now and again, ask yourself, are my shoulders relaxed? Are they down? And am I feeling relaxed? If you're hunching your shoulders up in tension, obviously it's going to hurt you and you're not going to get on very well if you do that. You shouldn't look down at the buttons when you play. I know when you're new, you kind of think, oh, is it the right button? Is it the right button? But eventually you've got to play without looking at the buttons, both hands. If it helps, use a video camera screen. I can see myself in a couple of uh, monitors here. Uh, or use a mirror, but don't look down. It's not a good practice, it's not a good style, and apart from anything else, you're gonna get horrible pains in your neck doing that. So, you know, avoid doing that, even though it's a bit tempting when you're new. Keep your fingernails uh, fairly short. Mine are a little bit long at the moment. They probably need a bit of a trim. But obviously, you know, you want your fingers to press the buttons, not the fingernails. So if your fingernails are very long, you're going to get extra clacking. These buttons are quite noisy as it is. If you're making extra noise with fingernails, uh, that's not desirable. So make sure your fingernails are short. When you put your fingers on the buttons, don't be flat like this, but curl them. Uh, particularly important when you're going for the G row, on this side and the inside row on the base side because obviously you don't want to be touching the buttons on the outside. So I would play with the fingers curled. Don't play flat. I, know, I have seen a lot of people who do play quite flat finger but I don't think it's a good idea especially in the early stages. Train yourself to curl the fingers over. And the right hand thumb can either go on the edge. Some melodians have a groove cut in the edge of the fingerboard to make that comfortable. I started by playing like that, but I eventually went to the Melodian death grip, as we call it, where the thumb goes round the back and you kind of, not exactly grip, but you hold the fingerboard. I found that a better method because it meant I could move my hand quickly. With the thumb on the edge, it's a little bit hard to sort of skid up and down, you know, so Melodian death grip for me, but you know, you have to experiment, see what works for you. Music stands are very, very useful when you're learning. Obviously, if you're in a Morris side, you can't go out with a music stand. I actually use three of them. If I've got a piece of music that's got lots and lots of pages, I spread them out over uh, three music stands. It's all to help with the ergonomics. 
to keep you comfortable, keep you relaxed when you're playing. If you've got music sheets cascading off your lap or off your knee or off the arm of the chair, it's obviously not conducive to good playing. You know, invest in a two or three music stands. I know it sounds like a bit of an expense. They're only about 19, 20 pounds at the time of doing this video. And uh, trust me, they're a really good investment. Set them all to the same height. And then you basically, if you put three together, you've got one long, gigantic music stand. And it's really, really useful, especially for my music, because I print it out really big. I only have uh, two bars per stave. So it doesn't take long before you're getting into, you know, five, six, seven sheets of music. A word about practicing. Don't practice for too long. Um, when I first started, I was so keen. I'd go on for hours and hours and hours. I wondered why I was completely exhausted and had loads of aches and pains in my neck and shoulders and fingers. Practice for a little while. Listen to your body. If it's starting to hurt, stop. Have a cup of tea. Have a break. Have a walk about. Come back. Don't keep on and on and on. It's really not a good idea. You need lots of breaks. You need exercise. And you need drinks. As far as the playing goes, one thing that is very important is the good control of the bellows. The bellows are the only volume control that you have on this instrument. Pressing the buttons harder or softer makes no difference to the amount of volume coming out of this instrument. It's all to do with the bellows. If you push hard or pull hard, the volume will go up. One thing that people struggle with at first is this thing, the air button. And it's part of the playing technique. It's not just there to close the bellows up or open them up uh, before or after playing. It's very important to incorporate it into the playing. Uh, obviously, if you operate the air button uh, and you're pushing, obviously you expel the air from the bellows very quickly. And if you operate it when you're pulling, it lets lots of air into the bellows quickly. And you sometimes need that because if you've got a load of notes on the pull coming up, you need to get the bellows closed up so that you can play those notes on the pull. Conversely, if you've got a lot of notes on the push, you need a lot of air in the bellows uh, to accommodate all those push notes. And sometimes you have to operate the air button while you're playing a note. And if that happens, uh, you need to push or pull whatever direction you're in harder so to make up for the loss of compression, the loss of volume momentarily. So your audience is not aware of the fact that you've used that air button. It's a tricky thing to sort out, the use of the air button, but with practice it does come. But that's briefly what you need to do. You also need to hold the left side up. Again, when I first started playing, I used to let the left side uh, droop down and then waggle the bellows that like that, rather than push them in and out. So keep the thing fairly square. Don't let it droop down like that. That's not a good uh, way of playing at all. Before you start playing a piece of music on this instrument, and I've seen really professional players do this at gigs, make sure you've got the fingers of both hands uh, ready on the appropriate notes, appropriate buttons. You know, if you're starting with a G chord and G bass, there's no shame in getting those fingers ready on those buttons. If you're starting on a G note on the G row, make sure your first finger's ready there so that you can launch into your tune successfully. Nothing worse than slapping your fingers down, launching off, and then finding you're on the wrong buttons. So always have a little look, have a feel around, maybe even play a couple of buttons, make sure you're right, and then away you go. If the first few notes of the tune are on the push, then make sure you open the bellows a bit. If they're all on the pull, then you can close them up a bit. Again, it's all preparation, uh, that's a good idea. Going to talk about the way I use my left hand fingers. Um, we've got eight buttons on the left hand side on the bass, and they're in uh, pairs. But I want you to think of the pairs as across this way in terms of the fingering, because what I do is I use finger one on these two buttons, the top two, finger two on these two, finger three on these two, and finger four on these two. Now, a lot of players, I would probably say most players, don't use four fingers. They either use three or two. And obviously, using three or two, you have to keep moving them up and down. Uh, with my way, it's very logical. It's a little bit harder, but it is incredibly logical because you've got uh, four buttons on each row and you've got four fingers. Where it's hard, of course, is where the little finger has to get over on this C bass, which you get in both directions. But once you've got used to it, I can strongly, thoroughly recommend it. 
easy for me to say, of course, because I've got very long fingers, but if you can manage it, um, try it and stick with it. If you really can't, then go to three or two fingers. Like I say, lots of really good players manage with only three or two fingers, so um, I can't argue with that. I can only say to you what works for me. So if you play a chord like B minor 7, which is a diagonal uh, chord, uh, I talked about this chord earlier in this uh, video, you'll use finger 1 there and finger 2 there, do you see? Here's an A minor 7, which is another diagonal shape. Do you see? And if you use your fingers the way I've suggested, uh, it makes life really, really easy. But as I say, a little bit awkward to get used to at first, and only you will know whether that's going to work for you. But don't dismiss it straight away. Give it a few weeks before you uh, go to three fingers or two fingers. Also on the right hand side, um, you don't want to be moving one finger up and down or two fingers up and down. Basically, every part of the tune you play is going to use a, a position where the four fingers are lined up on four buttons, like that and and when I want you to change position on the music, I put up one or down two, where you'll basically move the entire hand position uh, up or down the requisite amount of buttons. But make sure you use all four fingers. The little finger is notoriously weak, but if you don't uh, use it, you'll lose it, as we say. So make sure you use that little finger where it's needed, uh, because you need to get it really strong. It's a vital part of being a good player, in my estimation using all four fingers of the right hand. So that's the end of this video. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting and it will certainly save me uh, repeating all this in every video lesson I do. Obviously in the first 30 or so that I've done, I do say these things quite a lot, so you'll have to uh, forgive the repetition. But from now on, uh, I'm going to be doing video lessons without this information, so I will have assumed that you've looked at this video and the other one about my sheet music. Thank you very much for watching.